podcast. We demystify what goes on behind the therapy room door. Join us on this voyage of discovery and co-creative conversations. This is The Therapy Show, Behind Closed Doors podcast, with Bob Cook and Jackie Jones. Okay. Welcome back to the next episode of The Therapy Show, Behind Closed Doors, with myself, Jackie Jones, and the wonderful Mr. Bob Cook. And we're on episode 96 now. Oh, I was wondering what episode it was as I was settling down. 96. Oh, four more to go. Four more to go in a month. We'll, have, <laughs> we'll, we'll be reaching the centenary. I know, God, that'll be, that's going to be some celebration, a year of podcasts. A special one. Yeah, 100, 100 episodes. That's nearly two years, Bob. If we're doing one a week and there's 52 weeks in a year, that's not so far off two years we've been doing this now. No, it's pretty good. Pretty yeah. good. Pretty good going. So this episode is called Hope and Dread in the Therapy Process. Yeah, and I'm now looking at you in your therapy room. Yes. <laughs> so uh, it's very apt. Yeah, it's actually why why I came up with this title was that there's a very well known well he's died now unfortunately but very well known British psychoanalyst probably I would say the last uh, most successful most well known one in recent times uh, Stephen Mitchell and his last book was titled Hope and Dread. Uh, I'm not sure it was in the therapy room. I think it was Hope and Dread. In, I think it was just titled Hope and Dread. Um, he was a relational psychoanalyst, really, but he 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 was well known. And this book is really interesting. Really, it's um, 2010, I think, paperback. If you're interested in the subject matter, so I was wondering whether I was going to dread this podcast, podcast, <laughs> or whether I've got a feeling feeling of hope and uh, expectation so I wasn't quite sure one but I settled on the last one and I looked up the definition of hope and it is uh, I believe that something better will happen oh see that makes me quite emotional that Bob I like that yeah belief that something better is going to happen yeah however or stroke and <clears throat> emotional or not Hope in the therapy room uh, or in a clinical setting, I believe, has a double-edged sword. Okay. In other words, um, I used to say to a lot of my clients, hope was one of the most dangerous uh, words in the English dictionary. That's what I mean by a double sword. Because hope, of course, we I think there's a truth in the human essence that we keep hold of a belief that something better is going to happen. So therapeutically, that's the positive side of hope. Yeah. Keeping that desire, of course. The negative side or the flip side to that, of course, is when people, um, especially in relationships, stay in, stay in toxic relationships far longer than they should. Hoping for something better. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That's, that's that. I mean, another way I look at this, that most people come to therapy want the therapist to fix whatever the problem is. Yeah. Um, and they, they stay in the world of hoping, or can do, far longer than they should. And they may take a long time to be proactive because they're yeah. hoping magically yeah. that things will get better uh, which is, I said, is the definition of hope. But if you stay too long in that place, uh, you might hope forever. Yeah. So you think that sometimes people are just sitting hoping rather than being proactive in making a change? Yes. Yes, definitely. Okay. And, and they have a magic, and may have a magical belief that somebody's going to come around and uh, fix it or change things for them. Yeah. And there's, there's also that mindset of until, do you know what I mean? I'll stay here until something happens. I'll stay here until they change their mind or I'll stay here until things get better, whatever. So we just kind of tread water until something else happens. Which may never happen. Exactly. Yeah. 
Um, Eric Burnley, originator of transaction analysis, um, in his one of his last books, which is uh, one of his famous books on script, uh, one of the scripts that he named was one you just talked about there, uh, the until script. Yeah. Where people do exactly what you've just said. Yeah. And I think I come across that quite a lot with, with clients. And I think at times I actually have that myself when I think about it. That I'll do this you until a, <laughs> you have a trait of that in you. Yeah, yeah. That's interesting because you're, you, 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 you might have a trait of it. I don't know, but you're successful. You're proactive. You get things done. I can yeah. be at times, but then there's also that flip side with me. I think where, yeah, and where you can just. Hang around waiting psychologically. Yes. Yeah. I think to all of us, to a certain degree, <clears throat> might have that trait, if you want to put it that way, a little bit. The problem, though, therapeutically or in the clinical setting, is when that process becomes, or that script becomes fixed. Yeah. And nothing much else happens at all. Yeah. Yeah, because there's something about handing over that control to another person. Do you know what I mean? Like you say, if you're hoping that, you know, the client hopes that the therapist is going to fix them, it's like you're handing your future, your your life and everything over to somebody else to sort out. Oh, oh. And you must see that a lot of that in the therapy room over the years, haven't you? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and... You know that what having that magic wand, you know, to me when when a client wants me to fix them, the way that I look at it is that they've gone into their child ego state and they want somebody else to take control and to sort everything out for them. Yeah, because it's a it's a desire that comes from the child ego state or the younger self. Yeah, I mean, you know yourself that our children when they're younger um, hope desire, whatever word you want to use here, hand over that the parents will fix things for them and yeah. do things for them and anticipate their needs. Yeah. And to a certain extent, of course, when we're younger, um, you know, as a child growing up, in a way that is the function to some degree for the parent. The problem comes in later life if they're still, you know, caught up in that same process. Yeah. And I think at times I've kind of held the client in in that safe space without, you know, taking the control off them or letting them think that I'm going to fix it. But I think sometimes clients just need need to know that we're on their side. Yeah, I mean, there's a big word, word here often used in the clinical parlours, and that is infantilization. Mm. when we keep young we keep clients young yeah and we do it by attempting to solve problems for them yeah or attempting to fix it so they never have a degree of autonomy or independence or a way of working things out because the therapist there does it before they do it in other words the in other words, it's the opposite of what I think is one of the major principles of psychotherapy I follow. And that is that the therapist works towards um, helping the therapist or get to, uh, sorry, helping the client get to uh, the opportunity of their own truth, not the therapist's truth. Yeah. Have you, I have clients that often, it's like a hot potato that we pass between us. Do you know what I mean? Where I say, you know, if we're we're doing every so often, I'll do a, a you know like a catch up session where we look back over you know what we've we've done and how far we've come and the changes that have been made and all that sort of stuff. And I'll say, you know, when when we look back, how far you know you've come and the changes that you've made, I'm really proud of the work that you've done and you know how do you feel about it and all that sort of stuff and then they'll you know usually say something like I couldn't have done it without you 
it's because of you that I've done all of this stuff. And then I'll say to them, yeah, but you've done all the work. I've just been along with the journey for you. And we kind of like throw it backwards and forwards over who's, <laughs> whose responsibility it is, you know, that the changes have happened, if that makes sense. Yeah, it makes much sense. And this is why Eric Byrne in 1961, um, when he created his model of, you know, ego states and transaction analysis, as you and me trained it, put contractual theory at the top of his list. In other words, he wanted uh, therapists and clients bilaterally to create adult to adult contracts. Mm. For specific change not parent to child contracts yeah yeah which sits better with me because you know i know we've spoke about this many many times in in a lot of the you know the episodes that we've done that you know i don't feel like i'm the expert and i'm the one with all the answers you know it's like we go it's i'm okay you're okay and we go in on the same the same level yeah, and I feel comfortable with that. Yeah. How do you, um, I think it was 2019 that the uh, drama series set in Vienna in 1901 called uh, Vienna Blood, I think it's called. And you have a, a budding uh, detective um, and a, how can I explain this? A sort of consultant who's a medical person and he's also one of the first Freudians, in other words psychoanalysts. And it's interesting because it, 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 though the program is mainly about um, you know solving cases, he also comes up with these interpretations and what Freud would say, what Freud wouldn't say. Uh, and you're correct, Freudian psychoanalysis is based on a one up, one down position, where the psychoanalyst is the expert interpreting the meanderings of the patient, mm. not a adult to adult contract, a bilateral contract, where two people are working towards a specific change. So that would be an, a, a parent to child contract, then a Freudian contract. If absolutely, the, the absolutely. Yeah, yeah. to the extent that the analyst, the what do they call them, the clients or patients, let's say patients, would lie on, you know, the couch, and the analyst would stay as much as they can behind the uh, vision of the patient, and I think they were told to take to say no more than three interpretations in the 15 minute meandering, but they would be parent led interpretations. I quite like that word meandering. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, just going anywhere you want to go to. Uh, that, yeah. It's often called in the psychoanalytical parlors, free association. Um, but the, the interpretations were parent led. So the opposite of the idea of contractual theory and adult to adult specific uh, focuses on change. Yeah, I and think it's, em it's empowering for the client to understand that, you know, the changes that are made, that they've been proactive in it. It's kind of like hypnotherapy i've got nothing against hypnotherapy or hypnotherapists and i did an nlp course that had hypnotherapy as part of it and i think it has a, a role to play but for me it's kind of like done to a person <laughs> the person isn't proactive in it you, you just lie there with your eyes closed and and you're you know you're not really an active participant in it somehow yeah i i'm all for empowerment Adult to adult contracts at the beginning of the therapy. Yeah. A, a focus on the bilateral change both therapists and clients sign up for. Yeah. I think, absolutely. I think that's very empowering. So, what about dreading the therapy room then, Bob? That's just one. Well, yeah, I'd like to go on that. I just want to catch one step back on hope. Okay. So, so I'm saying the negative side is what we've just said, all those things. 
uh, and a really big negative side is when people stay in toxic relationships far longer than they should, hoping that somehow the relationship will change. Yeah. And they may stay in it to a level where the toxicity is so harmful that they then have to come to therapy. So that's what I meant by hope can yeah. also lead to people staying in very toxic, harmful relationships, hoping that the other person will change. Yeah. And when you're talking about toxic relationships, you're not necessarily talking about husband and wife or girlfriend and girlfriend or anything like that. It could be, you know, siblings or it could be a working relationship yeah. or it could be a parent and child, any. even though the child's adult. So any any relationship. Yeah. yeah. We stay in it and the, in TA language, you know, the child in the client yearn, yearns for an expected uh, process where things will get better. Yeah. And that's a very de-empowering place to come from. So I just want to say that, of course, the other side I've just talked to you about is the positive side where we can keep hold of the desire that things will change. But that balance around what hope means and what it doesn't mean for the clinic for the cloud is a really important one to reflect on, I think. Yeah. That's... Yeah. Because as well as, you know, the, the external relationships or whatever, the relationship between the, the therapist and the client as well, you know, that I always say to, to clients that, you know, if there is anything that's that's kind of rumbling in in our relationship that we need to bring that in the room and discuss it yeah that's right and you, you know jackie and i hope you do know this and i expect you do know it but you carry you are the vehicle usually of hope for the client anyway, does that make sense yeah 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 you carry their flame quite yeah often. Which is a responsibility. <laughs> yeah, it's a responsibility and it's a very important, I think, concept to reflect on. Mm. That you don't distinguish, uh, get rid of that hope, that it, you carry that hope. Yeah. And at the same time, um, explore the darker side of hope. Yeah. So I think hope's a really important thing to think about when in therapy. And of course, if we're going to go to dread, uh, dread is basically when we get so frightened and so worried that something awful is going to happen. So we dread going into a situation because we get excessively frightened or, wor or worried that the world will collapse or something dreadful is going to happen. That's yeah. really what dread is about. Yeah. But in the therapy process, you're going to experience that a lot with clients, of course, who know at some level that come to, you know, they have a motivation at some level or some hope, if you like. This is why hope and dread are sort of on this sort of fine balance. Um, that through a therapeutic exploration, their lives will get better. However, they often dread excessively worrying and get very frightened of the dark sides they might have to go to yeah. to find the lightness of hope. Yeah. And, you know, that that's something that I often have a discussion with clients in the early days. And, you know, I don't want to frighten them off or anything, but that sometimes it gets worse before it gets better. <laughs> you know, when it's right. coming because of anxiety, when we start to make a change and we do something different, that can be quite anxiety provoking. We can feel a bit more anxious if we're stepping out of our comfort zone or doing something that we don't generally do. So, you know, that, that feeling of dread or overwhelm is something that you see quite often. You see it very often. And that's why I said to you that you carry or you are the vehicle for the hope for the person or the client because the flip side is the dread. Yeah. They have to 
go to darker places, which perhaps they'd put into a compartment and repressed for a very long time. Yeah. That's what I mean, you see, by saying you carry the hope, the lightness, the beacon, that the change can happen. Yeah. That's why yeah. they're interlinked. Yeah, and it's kind of like you being the stability or the anchor and know that, you know, it's it's okay. Yeah, and the, you do <clears throat> go to some dark places sometimes with some clients in the therapy room. That's why I think dread is a good word. Yeah. Because that excessive fear and worrying that maybe they'll never get back or get stuck in yeah. that place. I, I've i just watched the whole series of Dark Materials, uh, which is on television. Do you know that? It's, it's the, it was the trilogy of the Pullman series. And for p people listening to it, who probably watched the, you know, what's this, these four episodes, I think, of the three books. And I think this episode is gone, so we're okay. Um, where the, uh, the lead person, I can't forget the girl, I can't forget, forget, forget her name at the moment, but anyway, um, she feels she has to go into the land of the dead. Wow. <laughs> to actually find her friend and redeem herself because she let her friend down and the hope that he will be there and that he will forgive her. So though she dreaded and she was frightened stiff of going into the land of the dead, the beacon of hope that something better would happen and forgiveness in this case, drove her to go into the land of the dead. She did actually find a, a friend who did, the little boy, did forgive her, if you want to put it that way. And together, they found a way out of the dreadful place of the world of the dead into a much more hopeful scenario. And I think therapy's like that. Yeah. I can't imagine a, a, a life or a world without hope. I like to think that we always have that, that beacon. Somebody, somebody somewhere has got that beacon. Well, in the clinical room, you often carry it for the client. Yeah. I believe, because they're so afraid of the dark places, they can't quite grasp hold of hope. Or that beacon of hope just for a while has gone out of sight. So it's the therapist's duty, if you like, or the therapist's position, just just hold that hope for them while we explore the darker places. What a wonderful way to end it. I quite like that. I'm very visual. When you're talking in metaphors and using all these sorts of things, I, I usually picture things in my mind, and I quite like that one. Yeah, and uh, that paperback is about this, and that balance between hope and dread is such a crucial, I think, place for therapists to not only reflect on, but take on the beacon of hope that the client just transfers over to you for a while while they go to places they may dread. Yeah. And it's through permissions, I think, and we've talked about this in another podcast, validity, um, protection, all the things that we have talked about in other podcasts, where a person tentatively holds the beacon, oh, sorry, passes the beacon of hope over to you, the therapist, to hold and to not let go of and to give back at a later time in the therapeutic process. I think. Yeah. And, you know, for anybody listening, this is why, you know, the therapy relationship is so important because the trust that you need between two people in order to do that. Oh, this won't happen without that. Yeah, yeah. This will not happen without deep trust. Yeah. And... Therapy, in my opinion, 
therapy effect you know effective therapy also won't happen without deep trust absolutely and a prerequisite of a working relationship yeah because if you're talking about somebody you know practically or metaphorically handing over the beacon of hope to somebody else to hold on to while they go to these dark places that's not going to happen overnight that's not going to happen in you know a few sessions no it won't do and that's the therapy that needs to happen i do all the assessments at the institute that means people come in and sorry they phone up or they email or whatever it is they come in for half an hour have an assessment and then I pass them on to therapists of their choice. Now, I always, well, this podcast has made me think about this, but I think I always think about how you know courageous it is for somebody to come into the therapy. And I also think the pin concept, you know, the pivotal concepts of what we're talking about, the hope, the desire so that something better will happen through the therapeutic process, coupled will coupled with nervousness, fear, yeah. worry, that it might not, that it might actually not get better. Yeah. They are huge components of a therapeutic process. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. It's true. Yeah. Yeah. Because, you know, the, the, if you've not been to therapy before you don't know what to expect you you know it's it's a it's a massive journey that people you know endeavor to take <laughs> they endeavor to take it and i never for one moment forget the courage it often takes for the person to come through the door even if they don't think they're brave in the first place mm. I think that quite a lot with with clients when they first come that you know for for us and I'm I'm not making light of the situation but for us you know we we do this day in day out we we have a lot of clients and we we you know we're going through this process you know consistently but for somebody to walk in for the first time it's a big deal very big deal and and quite often they may cut part of themselves off to force themselves to come in there therapy room yeah and pretend it's no big deal but it yeah. is a big deal and hope and dread are, hard, are very pivotal you know processes that play out in the therapy room from the beginning i believe yeah oh. absolutely it's interesting because it, only this week it's happened that i've had a new client that cancelled and, you know, straight away, I always think, right, I'll, you know, we, we made another appointment for, you know, in a week's time. But I got a sneaking suspicion that they cancelled, not because they weren't feeling very well, but because the fear had started to creep in. So right. I'm going to kind of give them the week. And if they cancel again, then I'll, I won't, I don't want to say I'll be on them, but. I will be having a discussion over the phone with them as to, yeah. you know, what's going on. Yeah. So dread. Yeah. Fear of the unexpected, a fear of black things, a fear of darkness, probably started to overwhelm them. And this is where I'm saying that the therapist needs to pick up the beacon of hope in this situation if and it's very difficult if they're not arrived there's only been one session if the person allows the beacon to be handed over to the therapist now of course you know clients may be not ready to do that and yeah. that's what i meant and sometimes people come into my uh office and they have said oh i've been meaning to come here for the last year Oh, I pass the front door when I look at the sign that says counselling and therapy, and I keep saying to myself, I must go there. Yeah. And eventually they find the motivation and the hope that things will be better. And they ring me up. Or they come to the front door. Yeah. Because I suppose there's always that situation or, or the possibility that, 
you know, the clients are, are thinking that I'm, I must go to therapy or if I go to therapy, things will get better. But then there's always that fear that what if I go to therapy and things don't get better? Yeah, hope and dread. That That's literally the, the hope. There's always going to be therapy that can help me. But what if is can often follow it. Yeah, that's what we're talking about. Yeah. And that's why I feel, and I have felt for a very long time through my career, how privileged I am when people hand over the beacon of hope to me. Yeah. And that you've you've held a fair few, I would imagine, over the 38 years that you've been doing it, Bob. Yeah, and I it's a, it's always been a privilege for me. Well, thank you for that. You're Another welcome. enjoyable podcast. So yeah. what we're going to be talking about next time is reparenting and what is it? Oh my gosh. <laughs> Big <need> topic. <laughs> We should have about four pod four podcasts on this, but we've only got one. Oh dear. Anyway, I I've en really enjoyed this podcast, and I'm sure I'll enjoy the next one. So I'll you see you until there. next time, Bob. Bye bye. Take care. You've been listening to the Therapy Show, behind closed doors podcast. We hope you enjoyed the show. Don't forget to subscribe and leave us a review. We'll be back next week with another episode.